During the summer of 1973, a group of North American ethnographers lived in a valley on the eastern slope of the Bolivian Andes. Early in their stay, they met an elderly Aymara Indian. He appeared to be a respected village leader, enjoying a vigorous and useful old age. But he was also a man relinquishing his hold on life through a process of withdrawing from his society, a process which offered the filmmakers a unique insight into Aymara culture and involved them to an extent they did not foresee in the story of Alejandro Mamani. Y que él quisiera que ustedes le vean con su máquina, que, que él piensa que ustedes deben tener alguna máquina para ver dentro de su cuerpo y saber si realmente el espíritu está dentro de su cuerpo o no. ¿Piensa usted que debemos probar? ¿Qué piensa? Es que no... Es muy difícil. Sí. Pero Imposible. piensa que... Ayudará a él o no? Bueno, yo en esto sería partidario de decirle que no, que nosotros no tenemos ninguna máquina para ver eso y que no, 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 no estamos en condiciones de hacer eso, ah. que no conocemos eso. ¿no? Exacto. Porque él piensa que el gringo pues sabe todo y conoce todo pues, y dice, tiene remedio contra todo. Dice esto entonces que quisiéramos bien salud de él, pero nuestras no, máquinas no sirven de este, pero si tenemos medicina o uh, como si dice bien espíritu para él, nuestros tenemos cariño para él y si va a ayudar a este, está bien. Tata Alejandro. Alejandro Mamani is spirit-possessed, a common condition among the Aymara. In their culture, the boundary between the natural and the supernatural is easily trespassed by humans and spirits alike. Alejandro's battle with the spirits is a fascinating study of the Aymara and their unique methods of coping with universal human dilemmas. The Aymara are an ancient people. They live over two miles high in a zone which denies them the lowlanders' comforts and immerses them in the rarefied and moody environment of nature's outermost margin. What is real to the Aymara is often invisible. Illnesses that touch some animals and let others thrive. Diseases that descend on the potato crop one year and permit a good harvest the next. This was Alejandro Mamani as he set out to harvest potatoes. On this journey to a distant field, he seems to effortlessly fulfill his accustomed role despite his possession. <laughs> Well, <laughs> 
Alejandro saw the poor harvest as proof that malignant forces were dogging his path. Is his possession by spirits a disease? Diseases are universal. Illness is culturally specific, and spirit possession is accepted among the Aymara. Alejandro is portraying himself as alert and defiant, but he became possessed when he couldn't prevent weariness from overcoming his lifelong vigilance. Alejandro has a view of himself as a village leader, is he? An insight into Alejandro's repeated threats of suicide. And his son-in-law seems to confirm Alejandro's status within the village. Just three weeks earlier, at the village's yearly fiesta, the ethnographers had filmed, but had not noticed, Alejandro in the most favored of roles. Exclusive leader of the procession of the village saint. The ethnographer's aspirin has, according to the son-in-law, been the cause of unwarranted optimism. Moreover, his assessment of Alejandro's progress verges on the cynical. Alejandro, his family, and his illness are now so intertwined that no single one of them can act without affecting another. A village leader quite suddenly finds himself spoken about as if he were a child. But this parent, like elderly parents everywhere, must look now to his children for care and support. 
And his children cannot give Alejandro the effortless understanding of the childhood companions he has outlived. The ethnographers return from a trip to La Paz to find Alejandro desperate. They have brought sleeping pills to replace the aspirin they had been giving him. If Alejandro can rest, perhaps he can resist his tormentors. If his family can sleep, perhaps their support will revive. Alejandro's family comprise the social context in which Alejandro can be viewed. As long as his illness is viewed as normal, he can count on continued support. Should he cross the line to abnormality, to insanity, his family may be able to justify withdrawing support. And who pays for the expensive treatments? If it is the family, they are undergoing serious sacrifices. <laughs> The family is ambivalent, pessimistic, yet unwilling to predict Alejandro will cross into madness. What a culture considers normal is never a static concept. Because he has been a leader, he can count on extra reserves of support. For the same reason, he must now reach deep inside for the stamina and dignity everyone, including himself, is accustomed to seeing. Hanu 
Formerly ambivalent, unwilling to confront their powerful father, the children now reluctantly, passively, move to curtail expenses. By doing so, they precipitate what they will not confront, his last will and testament. <laughs> The school teacher has come to draft the will, but the children hang back, reluctant to help the process begin, to dismantle the authority which has protected them, to take their last steps into adulthood. Alejandro has resisted this moment with all his considerable capacities. But now that it's here, he is determined that it be a fitting summation of his life. The steep mountainsides contain dozens of microclimates. Since ancient times, people have exploited them all by keeping small plots at various altitudes.
It would be a mistake to see the children as greedy or callous. They have undergone severe emotional as well as financial depletion. They have helped their father cling to life, though they themselves became convinced he was doomed. It would be foolish and impractical to be shouldered aside at this important event. The past has been Alejandro's glory, and he has glimpsed the future for what it is, an empty, friendless eroding of his legacy. Only now can the ethnographers begin to understand Alejandro's year-long struggle with forces that would reduce most Aymara to terror and defeat. Alejandro's battle with the spirits was the beginning of a fitting departure from life. Their powers near equal, their struggles bitter, but in the eyes of the culture, rational. But making the will was too climactic and delayed too long for Alejandro to escape a convulsive after effect. Alejandro's Honsi is acknowledged by his family. He tightened their grip. But the next morning, Alejandro is up before the rest of the family, selecting seed potatoes from storage. The spirits have receded. And as far as the ethnographers can tell, this is very much the same man they met when they arrived in Bolivia. He puts in a full morning's planting. When his children stop to eat, he remains for a while, treading the soil down over the newly planted seed. When the ethnographers left, Alejandro seemed fine.
Months later, they got a letter from their Bolivian assistant. Mostly, it was about his family. But right in the middle was a single sentence. Don Alejandro had another dream and went to the cliffs. The Aymara believe that the spirits of respected elders ascend to the mountain peaks which overlook their villages. It is significant that none of the malignant spirits they fear so much occupy homes nearly so lofty. Did Alejandro Mamani go mad? Or did he simply make use of accepted mechanisms offered by his culture to relinquish his life and leave what he lived for intact? 